All right, well, good morning, everybody. If you'd like to come in and grab your seat. Looking forward to our time together this morning. After our time of worship, we're going to be uh, looking at Luke chapter 19 this morning. And uh, so the Lord will have a message for us out of there. And uh, just grateful, the Lord blessing us uh, as an opportunity to just draw near to Him. And, you know, He promises as we draw near to Him, He draws near to us. Amen? And as Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together, the Lord says, I am there in the midst. There's a special presence of the Lord as we come together uh, like this and gather with Him. And it's always so refreshing, right? Times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. So let's stand together. And we will open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this opportunity to meet in the name of Jesus, Lord, and to draw near to you in this fashion. And we are grateful for the songs of the Lord. Thank you for Cerise, Lord, leading us this morning. And may our hearts be open, Lord, to respond to you, to worship you, Lord, and to just open our hearts and just communicate with you in worship. We ask that your hand will be upon us. And then, Lord, as we open your word and we begin to look into the word of God and and seek to, to be taught, Lord, we pray that you will open our hearts, that you will speak into our lives, Lord, that you will strengthen us in our faith and strengthen us, Lord, as your servants. And so we just lift up this morning to you. We are grateful for it. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, let's worship the Lord.
I won't forget the wonders of how you brought deliverance, the exodus of my heart. You found me, you freed me, held back the waters for my relief. Oh, Yahweh, you're the God who fights for me, Lord of every victory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And you have parted the sea, you have led me through the deep. Hallelujah, hallelujah. A cloud by day is a sign that you are with me. A fire by night is your guiding light to my feet. Freed me, held back the waters from my release. Oh, Yahweh, you're the God who fights on me, Lord of every victory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And you have parted the sea, you have led me through the deep. Hallelujah, hallelujah. To my Egypt, you took me by the hand. You led me out of freedom into the promised land. I will not forget you. I'll sing of all your love. And death is overcome forever because of what you've done. Oh.
stronger than the enemy, greater than my own belief, closer than the hair I breathe, oh Jesus, your nearness, oh your nearness is my good, oh be near, oh God, be near, oh God, because you're all hard to feel your presence and to know that you are here. Be near, oh God. Be near, oh God. Because you're all I want. You're all I want. Open my heart to feel your presence. To know that you are here. Your nearness. Oh, your nearness is my Sweeter than the honeycomb, safer than the safest home, louder than the echoes of my longing. Your nearness, oh, your nearness is my Still my first love And all I have is yours You are still my anchor Forever I'm secure You are still my Love. You're my guide in life. You with me on the fire, and you lead me through the night. You have my. Still my first love And all I'm longing for You'll always be the fortress My shelter in the storm stand together. Oh, how I love you, Jesus. You are my greatest joy. How I adore you, Jesus. Oh, my soul, joy.
Yes, Lord, there um, is truly um, no greater thing um, than uh, to just be with you, Lord, and um, think on your great love for us, Lord, and um, how uh, we love you in return, Lord. We want you to have all of our hearts and all of our lives, and we worship you now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Cerise. All right, you may be seated. And if you'd like to open up with me to the Gospel of Luke, the 19th chapter. Gospel of Luke, chapter 19. And we're going to look at the first 27 verses this morning. Luke 19, verses 1 through 27. And uh, we're going to be looking at the issues of faith and faithfulness. We're going to be looking at the issues of faith as it relates to salvation and faithfulness as it relates to uh, walking with the Lord, uh, having received uh, our salvation, walking in faithfulness. These two things, faith and faithfulness. We'll look at faith uh, as we'll see a man by the name of Zacchaeus come to know the Lord. He will put his faith in the Lord and be transferred from Uh, the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And uh, we'll see him receive the free gift of salvation through faith, Zacchaeus. And then Jesus is going to give us a parable uh, about a master uh, giving uh, giving some money to his servants and seeking for them to do business while he is away. And then when he comes back, he settles accounts with his servants. And so Jesus is going to be emphasizing Uh, our faithfulness with what we have been given. And I don't know about you, but it seems to me like we keep talking about this just about every week. But uh, I'm like, Lord, it hasn't been that long. And I I think we've talked about this. But here we are in the text and just enjoying what is, is before us. So we begin with faith, faith and salvation. Uh, Beginning uh, here in chapter 19, we'll look at uh, the first Uh, 10 verses. And so it says, Then Jesus entered, and he passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but he could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead, and he climbed up in a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down, and he received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He's gone to be the guest with a man who's a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood, and he said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half my goods to the poor, And if I've taken anything from anyone falsely, uh, by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. So Jesus here, he's in the southern area of Israel, and he is making his way. This is his final journey up to Jerusalem. When he reaches Jerusalem, we will see Jesus's triumphant entry, and then we will see uh, uh, the week that follows, uh, which will include his crucifixion and his resurrection. So he's on that journey, making his way up to Jerusalem. And as he passed through Jericho, which is in the south uh, near the Dead Sea, it's at sort of the top of the Dead Sea area there, Behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. So Zacchaeus was working for Rome, right? He was working for the bad guys, uh, as the the Jews would look upon it. And he was a chief tax collector. That means he had other tax collectors underneath him, and he was of significant authority. And uh, thus, in in his business, he had become uh, quite wealthy. Well, uh, he heard that Jesus was near, there was a crowd passing, and, and he sought to see who Jesus was. It's funny, but the scripture says, but he could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So 
Uh, the crowd prevented Zacchaeus, who desperately wanted to see Jesus. You know, my dad always told me that I was average height. My dad was 5'8". He said 5'8 is average height. And so I had no, uh, you know, like stigma uh, about not being tall until I went on staff at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa. And those of, guys, those of you who remember Calvary Costa Mesa, think of John Mann, think of David Manny, right? Uh, Craig Coffin, all these guys are, are, are tall. Uh, and, and so one day we were all talking and I said, well, I'm average height, right? And the room got really silent. <laughs> but um, as we've been studying in the Proverbs on Thursday nights, I don't forsake the counsel of my father. So I, I still believe I'm average height. At least it's average for my life. I've been a little shorter and, you know. But anyway, so Zacchaeus, he wanted to see Jesus. He was, he was eager to do this. And the Lord knew his eagerness, and he is going to surprise Zacchaeus. Uh, we read that Zacchaeus in verse 4, he ran ahead of the crowd, and he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. So Zacchaeus is not worried about looking a little undignified for this opportunity to uh, get a glimpse of Jesus. And, and so um, he did that. And so when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he saw him and he said, Zacchaeus. Now, where did Jesus get his name? We've already been told in the text, but where did Jesus get his name, right? Does not the scripture say that Jesus calls his own sheep by name, amen? And so the Lord knows every person, especially those who are going to become his sheep. And so he calls him by name. That must have really, really surprised Zacchaeus that Jesus stopped and called him by name. And it, then what followed must have surprised Zacchaeus even further. Jesus said, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And so Jesus is inviting himself over to spend time at Zacchaeus' house. And so, you know, I think the Lord knew what a treasure this would be for Zacchaeus. I, knew, I think he knew what a blessing it would be for him. And he also knew that on this very day that Zacchaeus was going to become one of his own, right? So Zacchaeus, he sent a quick text to the housekeeper. Oh, that's not in the text. It was just my man. Okay, verse 6. It says that he made haste and he came down and he received him joyfully, happily received Jesus into his home. But the crowds, when they saw it, they all complained, verse 7, saying, he's gone to be the guest with a man who is a sinner. So they were offended that Jesus had chosen to go to Zacchaeus' house. They didn't feel like it was right. But then Zacchaeus stood. So you can imagine, a, you know, a nice lunch is taking place or an early evening meal is happening. And, and Zacchaeus stood and he said to the Lord, look, Lord, I give half my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore four, fourfold. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to his house. So Zacchaeus came to faith in the Lord Jesus. No doubt Jesus was, uh, you know, talking you know, as they were having dinner, there were others there, the disciples, and Jesus was talking and and, and the, the things of Jesus' Messiahship, his lordship, uh, were, were, of course, heard by Zacchaeus. And so Zacchaeus took a stand, and he, he is simply demonstrating the, the change of heart that has come into his life. For years, Zacchaeus has been on the take, right? He's been on the take. But here in the presence of God, manifest in the flesh, Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, how much he knew of him, it's all just really beginning. But here in the presence of the Lord, as Zacchaeus is putting his faith in him, he realizes, you know, the ministry of the Lord is, 
is helping the poor. And so he simply says, I give half my goods to the poor. It, it, you could call it a free will offering, right? Zacchaeus is just demonstrating his faith related to things that are meaningful to the Lord. And he says, I give half my goods to feed the poor. You know, Zacchaeus probably lived just fine after doing that. It probably didn't set him back too much. He says, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, the commentators say if means sense. It might. We know that tax collectors, their character was low. So the commentators suggest that the text might be considered this way. Since I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And that was the, the teaching of the law. Zacchaeus was aware of the law of God, right? In the law, if you stole and were caught, the penalty was that you had to restore fourfold. So Zacchaeus is simply demonstrating by his actions his faith in the Lord. We're not really emphasizing Zacchaeus's actions as much as we're emphasizing his faith. Okay? And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. Abraham is the father of faith, right? He's exercising the type of faith that Abraham had. And thus, he is uh, shown to be a son of Abraham. Today, salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So Jesus has accomplished a goal. He has saved a man's soul. And his life will be forever changed on earth. And his, his address will be forever changed in eternity. Amen? He's just moved up. <laughs> up out of the ghetto onto the, the, the hill as far as eternity is concerned. Right? And so we remember the teaching of scripture that the angels in heaven rejoice over one sinner who repents. The Lord is, the Lord is blessed here. A soul has been saved. And so, you know, I, I would imagine that the chosen, when they, if they shoot this scene, are going to show Jesus with a, an expression of joy, right? Today, salvation has come to this house. Jesus is happy. He saved a soul. It, it won't be too, uh, too many days later that Jesus is going to hang on the cross and he's going to bear Zacchaeus' sin upon his own body. That Jesus is going to trade away his life. Jesus is going to die on the cross that Zacchaeus might live because he's put his faith in Jesus. Because Jesus' blood will be shed on the cross, Zacchaeus will have the opportunity to spend eternity in heaven, just like you and I. And so I believe the Lord is rejoicing, for the Son of Man, he says, has come to seek and to save that which was lost. It says, now as they heard these things, verse 11, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God would appear immediately. So he's going up to Jerusalem, as I said. Uh, the disciples, as well as the crowds, are expecting that the kingdom of God is going to appear when Jesus reaches Jerusalem that he's going to throw off Roman power, at least that's what uh, I'm sure what the crowds are thinking, that he's going to throw off Roman power and begin to establish the kingdom of God upon the earth. But we know that that was not the plan of the Lord in his first coming, right? That the plan of the Lord was to go, to lay down his life as a sacrifice. He would be slain as the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. He would be buried in the third day he would raise from the grave. He would then ascend to the right hand of the Father where he is today. He would pour out his spirit upon the earth to draw people to faith in him. And then he will one day return to set up his kingdom. So the people were not expecting that delay in the setting up of the kingdom. So he spoke this parable uh, because they thought he would appear immediately and he's going to teach them now about uh, not faith like Zacchaeus, but he's going to teach them about faithfulness. 
living in faithfulness during the gap between his resurrection from the dead and his second coming. Now, as we study the parables, every parable has one particular meaning. It's given for a singular reason. There is one point, okay? But laced within the parables, many times are various truths that are taught in other places of Scripture. So Jesus is going to talk about a nobleman who goes to receive a kingdom. So Jesus rose from the dead. He's now uh, received the kingdom from the Father, but he's waiting till his enemies be made his footstool. He's going to come back, right? And so we see different truths that are taught solidly other places in Scripture that are sort of lightly referenced to, um, but we don't, we don't make those light references the main point. There is one main point, and as we study the parables, we need to seek to come to the main point. I was uh, talking with a, a friend uh, a while back, and, and he had get, been given the opportunity to share on the, um, the parable of uh, the ten virgins. And man, he was just going after every aspect of the parable. And he was saying, now, does this mean it? Does that mean it? And he was, you know, getting into heavy theological issues based on the parable. And it's like, bro, the parable is about one thing. The parable is about being ready for Jesus to come back. Keep that the focus. Okay. And uh, other things in the parable that you see, you know, taught in other places of scripture, you can bring that in alongside. But the teaching of the 10 virgins is to be ready, right? Five were wise, five were foolish. The ones that had oil went in with the bridegroom. That's like people being ready for the Lord. The five that were foolish had no oil. They weren't saved. They didn't come into the, they didn't get invited into the wedding feast. So anyway, so the one message of the parable is faithfulness. But as we look at this parable, we see Jesus likened to the uh, landowner who goes away to receive a kingdom. And uh, he commits responsibility to servants like Jesus has committed responsibility to you and I and then the uh, the the uh, nobleman will come back just like Jesus is going to come back and then he settles accounts with his servants those who are faithful are rewarded and so that's the the, the teaching of the passage is us learning to be faithful that we might be rewarded as the Lord desires to reward us so Jesus begins in verse 12. He's, uh, Jesus said, Therefore, he said, A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive a kingdom, uh, to receive for himself a kingdom, and to return. So he called ten of his servants, and he delivered to them ten minas. And he said to them, Do business till I come. But his citizens hated him, and they sent a delegation after him, saying, We will not have this man rule over us. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, uh, he then uh, commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then the first king, saying, Master, your mina has earned ten minas. And he said to him, Well done, good servant. Because you are faithful in very little, have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Master, your mina has earned five minas. Likewise, he said to him, You also be over five cities. Then another came to him, saying, Master, here is your mina, which I have kept and put away in a handkerchief. There will be no gains from that mina, uh, as we will read down a little bit later. So, um, Jesus likening himself to a nobleman going to a far country, ascending to heaven, receiving a kingdom, and calling his servants, and he delivered to them ten minas. So, ten servants, each one got a mina. How much is a mina worth? Well, it's worth about three months' wage, so he gave each of these guys a mina, and notice the instruction. He said to them, do business till I come, right? <laughs> the, the, the nobleman might have said, have I made myself clear, <laughs> right? Well, well yes, you, you've just 
fronted us some money. It's your, your money. And what you want us to do is you want us to do business with this until we see you again. The nobleman would have said, that's right. And that's what I expect of you. And so uh, we read in verse 14 that his citizens, that is where he was presently dwelling before he left to go receive an additional uh, kingdom, his citizens hated him. And they sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man reign over us, even like uh, the, the world rejected Jesus Christ, right? Sending a delegation uh, to Pon Pontius Pilate saying, we will not have this man reign over us. And even today, much of the world says, we will not have this man reign over us. Jesus has gone to receive a kingdom. He's going to be coming back. These are all just like, you know, additional uh, tidbits to the to just kind of think on. And um, so, you know, you have to wonder if the unfaithful servant maybe wondered if, if the master was not going to come back. Because they sent a delegation saying, we don't want this guy to come back and reign over us. Maybe he wondered, I'll, I'll give it some time. Maybe he won't come back. We don't know why he was unfaithful. But so it was that when he returned, oh, don't you know it? The Lord's going to do exactly what he said. He said, I'm coming back. Uh, when, when Jesus ascended to heaven uh, in the presence of the apostles, there were some angels who said, men of Galilee, why do you look into heaven? This same Jesus uh, who was taken into heaven shall so come in like manner. Jesus is going to come with clouds. He's going to return to the Mount of Olives. The Lord will come. Jesus asked, when the Son of Man returns, will he really find faith on the earth? He said, uh, you know, in the rapture, uh, two men will be in the field. One will be taken. The other will be left. The Lord's going to come. So it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, that he commanded those servants to whom he had given the money to be called that he might know what every man had gained by trading. Then the first came saying, Master, your mina has earned 10 minas. So for just, just for the sake of our getting our imagination around it, let's picture a mina being a single coin. Maybe it's an awfully big coin. Maybe it's the size of a giant pancake because it's three months wage. But let's just think of it as a coin. So the first came and said, Master, your mina has earned 10 minas. He's got now 10 to present back to the master. And the master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant, because you were faithful, notice these words, in very little. Wow, I, I, I wouldn't have used those words, uh, three months wage. But in comparison, look at this. Because you were faithful in very little, have authority over ten cities. Nice. Nice. Can you imagine having ten th uh, authority over ten cities in Orange County? Okay. So I want... Seal Beach, Huntington Beach, Newport Beach, uh, down to Laguna. Take me as far down to San Clemente as I can get, right? Uh, Dana Point, San Clemente. I want everything from Seal Beach down to Camp Pendleton, you know? So in a sense, though the, the servant was faithful over three months' wage, what he received in, in return was enormous in comparison. Amen. Listen, guys, the Lord knows the glories of heaven and his kingdom. He knows what's there. He knows what's coming. And the Lord seems to be constantly teaching us about being faithful with what he has given because he is going to bless upon his return. And it, it, it it's as the scripture says, my eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Amen. So we're to be very encouraged about this. Now to give a, uh, an illustration, he was given one mina, right? He gained uh, 10 more, right? Your, your one mina has earned 10 minas, Okay. What if we uh, had a little game? What if we gave each of us one dollar? And I said, 
by trading, this is a game now, by trading, by doing business, let's see who can gain $10 first. Okay? And whoever gains $10 first gets a, you know, a, a, a dinner at Lucille's for two, as much as you can eat, right? And so uh, think, how would you turn $1 into 10 Well, I know what I would do. I'd go to the 99 cent store and I'd buy something for 99 cents and then I'd try and sell it for two. Then I'd go back to the 99 cent store and buy two of those and try to sell both of them, then I'd have four. Jonathan would be like, Dad, you're wasting your time. You buy one of these computer cables at the 99 cent store, you can sell online for 10 bucks, no problem. I know what Chris would do. I, I see you back there, Chris. Chris would go to his friend and say, hey, I'll give you this dollar. You give me 10 in return, and I will take you to dinner at Lucille's. <laughs> but if we, if we did that in a game, it would take effort, right? You'd have to think it through. You'd be like, how am I going to do this? Because it's a, it's a race. How can I do this? How can I work? How can I get it done? Listen, guys, there's an aspect of this that is a responsibility that has been given to us that we would pay attention that much with what we have been given. We have the gospel message, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that was, which was lost. We should really be thinking through and planning and, and working to save souls. We should be working at it. It's what God wants. It makes him happy, Right? We have been given gifts of his spirit, different abilities, and we should really be thinking about how we can use them. Like in a game, we want to win. we're, We're plotting and strategizing how we can use our gifts in order that we might gain an increase for the kingdom. Jesus is teaching us about living this way. And so I, I, I want to encourage us, guys. I want to encourage us. You know, if you were a Jehovah's Witness and you had been baptized as a Jehovah's Witness, you would be handed a time card. And on that time card, there would be levied an amount of hours that you were uh, required to spend going door to door talking to people about their opinion of Jesus. Did you know that when those people knock at your door, they're on the clock? That, they, that this is levied upon them, they have to fulfill it? And, and if you were in the Mormon church, there would be pressure levied upon you to dress the way they dress and to be out on the street and they send their, their young people on, on mission trips. It's, the church levies it upon them. It's not of God. Every false religion abuses its people. But not Jesus. Jesus is full of grace and Jesus is full of truth. So in his grace, he says, salvation is a free gift. My relationship with you is a free gift. Your home in heaven is a free gift. The the. The intimacy that we share and love with one another, it's a free gift. But you need to know this because of the truth. With the responsibilities and the gifts and the talents that I've given you, if you use them, there will be an exceedingly abundant reward that you will inherit. And you will inherit it based on your increment of faithfulness. This is true. This is true. So when the first came to give account of his mina, he said, your mina has earned 10 minas. How did he do that? It's not easy. And he said to him, well done. I mean, the guy worked at it. Well done, good servant, because you were faithful and very little have authority over 10 cities the guy's like stoked the second came saying master your mina has earned five minas that's not easy to do how do you take one dollar and earn five think about it 
Or, or if I gave you $100 and I said, see if you can earn $500. It's not that easy. You got to work at it. You got to think. So he, the master was pleased. He said, likewise, you be over five cities. The guy's blessed, man. He took 100 bucks, earned 500 Now he's over five cities. He's stoked. Then the other came saying, Master, here's your mina, which I have kept and put away in a handkerchief. Hmm. He said, for I feared you because you are an austere, that is a severe man. You collect where you did not deposit. You reap what you did not sow. And he said to him, out of your own mouth, I will judge you, wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man collecting where I did not deposit, reaping where I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank that I might receive it at my coming? I might have collected it with interest. And all the crowd would have went, ooh, that's right. <laughs> the dude made a mistake, right? The dude made a mistake. Uh, just using our imagination, he put the money in a handkerchief. Why did he do that? Why, why didn't he just put it on, his, on the top of his dresser? Or why didn't he leave it on, on the counter by the coffee pot? Why did he put it in a handkerchief? Well, he hid it and protected it. And, and just, to, just to make a little application, you know, sometimes our focus can be, I want to lead a good Christian life. But we're not mixing it up with unbelievers. We're like a coin that's, in a handkerchief, folded up and hidden away. We're not becoming defiled, but we're also not interacting with the world around us. That's a mistake. Jesus went to Zacchaeus' house. He didn't go over there to have a beer. He went over to Zacchaeus' house. Zacchaeus came to know the Lord. So we need to understand where our mixing ought to be. It should be that we can be amongst people, that we can be the light of the world and to share the gospel. Not like a coin wrapped in a handkerchief put in a drawer somewhere. So, the master of the house said, why did you not put my money at least in the bank? So, it wasn't just that he wanted to protect the coin so that it didn't get misplaced. Although, <laughs> For application's sake, we made a part of it. Uh, we made some application there. Uh, why did you not put my money in the bank? That at my coming, I might have collected with interest. Eh, I just didn't want it. I just didn't want to take the time. I wasn't sure that I was going to see you again. <laughs> I mean, after that delegation, after we said, we don't want this man to rule over us, I thought maybe that was it. So... Verse 24, he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him and give it to him who has 10 minas. But they said to him, master, he has 10 minas. Then Jesus says, for I say to you that everyone who has will be given. And from him who does not have, even at what he has will be taken from him. Then Jesus says, bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. So <laughs> in the second coming of Christ, Jesus' enemies will be slain before him. But, um, you know, Jesus, as he, as he addresses the servant who was unfaithful, Jesus says, take the mina away from him. But then he also says, give it to the guy who has 10 minas. And like kids, they say, but he's already got 10 minas. It's not fair that he should get another one. But you see, Jesus is rewarding faithfulness. The one who was most faithful, he received an additional reward. Jesus is trying to teach us that. If you focus on being faithful, if you use what I've given you, you're going to be rewarded. It's going to be compounded. And so uh, he says, uh, for I say to you that everyone who has, okay, We've got to fill in the blanks here a little bit. You decide whether or not it's biblical or not. I don't mean to add to the word of God. For I say to you that to everyone who has been faithful, everyone who has been faithful will be given more or an exceeding reward. 
and from him who does not have faithfulness, even what he has uh, will be taken away from him. And so uh, the uh, absence, uh, the reverse circumstances when, uh, you know, we are, are not faithful, you know, sometimes the, the Lord can just start closing up um, opportunities um, if we haven't been faithful. But, you know, that's not really the focus of the parable. The focus of the parable is that we would seek to be faithful, that we're going to be exceedingly blessed with what the Lord is going to give back to us. We need to understand this. Each of us have been given by the Lord. The Bible says, as each man has received a gift, let us use it. We've all received from the Lord. We have the gospel message. We have this treasure, the Bible says, in earthen vessels, right? That the excellence of the glory might be of the Lord and not of us. But we've been given the treasure, okay? Now, Jesus has said, do business till I come. So not in a condemning way, right? Not like the Jehovah's Witnesses, or not like the Mormons, but let us ask ourselves, are we doing business? If we are, praise the Lord. If we are not, we need to change. We need to change in light of our coming King and in light of of eternity and just knowing the heart of God. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. None. There's no condemnation. But knowing the heart of the Lord, we want to get on board with Him, right? Jesus says, do business till I come. Paul said, run that you might win. Win the contest. Get the free dinner to Lucille's. You'll be blessed. You know you will. You know you will. So this is the, the, the light in which the Lord would have us to live. And may the Lord bless and strengthen each one of us that we might be faithful and mindful about the business that he has for each one of us. Amen? All right, let's stand together. If you're with us this morning and you are sort of new to church or the things of Jesus Christ, uh, we want you to know this morning that God loves you very, very much and that he is aware of who you are. He cares for you and that God has sent his son Jesus into this world and he has gone and died on the cross for your sins and for my sins. Jesus hung on the cross, nails pierced through his hands and his feet. Jesus laid down his life and he died to be a sacrifice to make payment for the wrongs that we have done. So the sacrifice has been made. The payment for sin has been, has been rendered. But through faith in what Jesus Christ has done on the cross, God will now forgive you of every sin you have ever committed, and he will welcome you as a son or a daughter into his kingdom. But the responsibility is ours to place our faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. And so if you'd like to know more about that, there are leaders there at uh, the church and leaders among us that can um, talk to you more about putting your faith in Jesus Christ and being forgiven. And uh, you can know that you have uh, received eternal life. And so please don't leave today if that is uh, something that, um, a step that needs to be taken uh, in your life. But let's uh, bow our heads and, and close here. Lord, we thank you for the teaching of your word this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the grace and the truth. Lord, faith and faithfulness. And so, Lord, it means so much to us that we're unconditionally accepted by you, that we're saved, we're, we're as saved as we're ever going to be, we're fully accepted. Lord, your heart is, is full of joy towards us simply by the fact that we are your children. But we also understand, Lord, that there are other things on your mind. 
And so, Lord, as children that grow and mature, we, we want to, to serve in the family household. And we want to listen. We ask that you will strengthen, Lord, each one of us. We kind of have an idea about ways that we need to be faithful with what you have given to us. Strengthen us, Lord. Each one of us, may none of us leave here today, not a single one of us that hasn't been encouraged and fortified and built up in this, Lord. We want to go forward in victory. We want to see the kingdom advanced. We know that your spirit is willing, Lord. May our flesh not be weak in this. But may you baptize each and every one of us in the power of your Holy Spirit that we might serve you and glorify you in an acceptable manner. And we thank you, God, for all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, uh, Panama City Beach, God bless you, church. We'll be uh, signing off with you now. And uh, Calvary Chapel Crossover, may God bless and strengthen each one of us. Amen. May his hand be upon us as we go throughout our week. And uh, may that still small voice of the Lord, amen, be saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. All right, we'll close in a final song. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out of your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out of your praise. We shout out of your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross, then he rose up from that grave. My God is still rolling stones away. Yeah, there's joy in the house of the Lord. Joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out of your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out of your praise. We shout out of your praise. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, and now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord, joy in the house of the Lord today. Oh, we shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out of your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out of your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out of your praise. We shout out your praise. God bless you guys.